Today's scripture is taken from Romans 8, verses 14 through 17. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves, so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Um, I just love this picture. I, I chose this picture as kind of the artwork for our series, as the graphic for our series. And it just makes me smile every time I see it, looking at all that produce. I just have to tell you that I am somebody that just loves a great garden. I do. I love a great garden. Vegetable garden, flower garden. That doesn't mean I'm a gardener. I want to be clear about that. I mean, sometimes I'm specifically told, stay away from the garden, because I have this tendency to prove, you know, pick out things that I'm not supposed to you know, dig up, and uh, I'm just not good. I'm good at making sure the garden's watered, but I'm just telling you, I just love to go and watch a garden day after day as it grows and as it, as it blooms and as it flourishes and bears fruit. We, uh, in Coeur d'Alene, before we moved, we had the garden nailed. It was beautiful. My wife, she's here. I got to brag on her. She's an awesome gardener. We had a vegetable garden. We had a perennial garden. We had a rose garden. And there was nothing better for me to come home after a work day and go outside and just spend, I don't know, about 10 minutes just looking. Just looking at everything, watching how it was progressing, how it was blooming. I would go pick some tomatoes or I'd pick out some lettuce for our salad. And nothing made me happier. I don't know. I just, I'm a garden lover. And uh, that's why this series has been so great. Because our faith is like a garden. Our, our life with Christ is like a garden. It is growing all the time. And there's nothing better than every day just stopping and marveling at how God is blessing you with growth and with beauty and with fruitfulness. I hope you're taking time to just, to just enjoy what God is doing in your life. And that's really what we want to do in this series. Enjoy what God is doing in our life by taking a fresh look at the different uh, beliefs that we have as Christians about who God is, about who we are, and what God is doing in our lives and in the world. So four weeks ago, this is our fourth week in this series, we started out with the Christian definition of God, which is Trinity. One God in three per persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And really, since then, we've been trying to unpack that, talk about who God is, who Jesus is. But the one thing that we have not done is spend a whole lot of time on one of the persons of the Trinity, the last of the persons of the Trinity, the third, and that's the Holy Spirit. So we're going to change that today. My goal is that you're coming out of here with just a fresh understanding of who the Holy Spirit is, not just as a part of the Trinity, as a part of God, but in your life. So that's, that's what I'm going to do. Let's get started with that. And let's look at the Nicene Creed. So this is one of the earliest statements of faith of, our, of Christianity. This is in 381, I think it was, A.D., when the Nicene Creed was written, a beautiful statement about uh, our Christian faith. And this is what it says about the Holy Spirit. It says, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the ages. And we really get the sense from these words that the Holy Spirit is, is a thing, is important, but also it has a personality, is, is a being in and of the Holy Spirit's own self. Uh, it, it's called here the Lord, 
the giver of life. There's activity. There's agency. Notice the who. The Holy Spirit is a who, not an it. It's a who in your life. It is a personality. It is a being that is connected with what God is doing in the world. But what's interesting is not a lot of people, specifically not a lot of Christians, know who the Holy Spirit is. There was a survey that was done in 2020 of 167 million Americans about their religious faith. And so Christians got asked questions about their religious faith, American Christians. And guess what? 58%... Over half of those who responded to the survey did not believe that the Holy Spirit was an entity in and of the Holy Spirit's own self. They just saw it as as a symbol of God's power, but not real as a person of the Trinity. Can you believe that? And, and so then when it kind of drilled down, there were different categories of Christians. And so it asked the question specifically of a demographic that, who were Orthodox Christians. Not in terms of Eastern Orthodox or Russian Orthodox, but those who really thought of themselves as knowing it. They, they had the faith down. They were doctrinal. They read the Bible a lot. They were, you know, super Christians. Guess how many of those, what they believed about the Holy Spirit? didn't believe the Holy Spirit was real as a separate entity, as as a person of the Trinity, but only as just the symbol, as a way of describing God's power in their lives. 39%. So my, again, my goal is that you are not in that side of the percentage. You know who the Holy Spirit is, and we're going to talk about that today, okay? Okay. Ready? Well, you're going to want to open up your Bibles to the scripture that was just read for you, Romans chapter 8. This uh, chapter 8 is uh, such an exciting chapter. There is so much going on. In fact, um, commentators look at the literary style, look at the tone, and they say that this is the most enthusiastic writing style that we find from the Apostle Paul, who wrote the letter to the Romans. In other words, he's rolling. The, the, the way that he's writing is betraying him, as getting really excited. Things, the words are just rolling uh, onto the paper from his mind and his soul. He's getting exciting. He's getting pumped. He wants to tell people about, specifically, the Holy Spirit. And there's so much meat in this chapter. There's so many things we can talk about. This is kind of the apex chapter of the book of Romans. And sometimes people say this is the best chapter that Paul wrote. Chapter 8. You read through chapter 8 and you're going, oh, that verse is in there. Oh, that verse is in there. And it's, it is packed. But we're just going to look through verses 14 and 17 and specifically about what Paul says here about the uh, Holy Spirit. So what I want you to notice right off the bat, as you're looking at it, I hope you're looking at it, so you can kind of study with me and engage your mind with me. One thing that you'll, you'll notice that there are three titles that are given to you, that are given to Christians, because of the work of the Holy Spirit. There are three titles. Do you see them? First one's right away. It may say uh, sons of God, but really what that means, I think we can better translate it children of God. So it's not just the guys that are getting recognized here. It's the women as well, sons and daughters of God. You are children of God. Man, this is a turnaround. This is a turnaround. Because if you've been with us and what we've talked about the last couple weeks, or if you read the first few chapters of Romans, uh, we, we were not setting ourselves up to be called children of God. Something way different. We were rebels from God. We were those who were haters of God. We rejected God. We fell short of God all of the time. We were those who lived in sin, regret, guilt, shame, brokenness, 
um, rejection, rebellion, all of this stuff, that, that that's what characterized us. And, and then in just a, a, a few chapters later, we are being called children of God. What happens? Well, we already know what happened, and that's Jesus. But the Holy Spirit is the person of the Trinity, the one true God who comes to us and confirms what Jesus has done, and that is to welcome us back into God's family. How cool is that? And he goes on to describe the nature of how we are a child. Do you see the word adopted? Look down there. Do you see it? If you, if you see it, then kind of nod your head or raise your hand or whatever. Do you see the word adopted? So um, this is a a special designation for us in the Roman times, in the times that this was written, in the Roman Empire, adoption was a legal status that was given to, to someone to welcome them into a family and to grant them full status. So in other words, if you're an adopted daughter or an adopted son, you were on equal footing with those who were natural born. Let me say that again. You're on equal footing. You have just as much status as an adopted child as you would if you were a natural born child. So God is saying that through the Holy Spirit, what Paul is saying is through the Holy Spirit, we are considered adopted children of God on equal status with God's natural child. God had only one child. Who's that? You can say it a little bit more confidently. <laughs> you know this, right? Jesus? Yeah, Jesus. So what is Paul saying here? Because of your adoption as children, you're not like the, you know, the little sister who's kind of annoying and, you know, doesn't feel like they have as much status. No, 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 no. You are on the same plane as Jesus. Which means that, and here comes the third title, do you see co-heirs or heirs? Do you see that? That means that what comes to the natural born first child is also coming to you. The full inheritance. All of the work that God has done. All the blessing of God for his children. It's coming to you in the same way it comes to Jesus. You are co-heirs with Jesus. How awesome is that? And that is because of the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Check out verse 17 at the end. Even the struggles and the suffering of life, which frankly also come with following Jesus. We take up Jesus' cross. We take on the suffering for the sake of the world that Jesus took on. We are grieved and we sacrifice ourselves so that the world can know the love of God. We are willing to go the distance in terms of our suffering for Christ. But even in that, we have God's own presence bringing us comfort and help and hope even through our darkest time. Even through our darkest time. So we have this amazing uh, work of the Holy Spirit, and we already have, look at this, we're going to build a list here of all the, the, the terrific and fantastic blessings that come to you because there's a Holy Spirit. And the first, we've already read. You are a child of God. You are an adopted child of God and you are a co-heir in Christ. But if we go to another place in Paul's writings, the letter to the Galatians, then he lists out these fruits of the Spirit. Have you heard of those? The fruits of the Spirit. And he says that those also come to those who are, have committed their life to Christ have aligned themselves with Jesus, and because of that, have the Holy Spirit. And if you have the Holy Spirit, then all of this stuff comes along with it. Look at this list. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, 
faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. This isn't stuff you have to wait to get. This is the stuff that just comes with the Holy Spirit. If you have the Holy Spirit, which you have if you're following Jesus, then you get all of this, and that's not all. Elsewhere in the Bible, it talks about things the Holy Spirit brings us, like, um, let me find it here. Yes, um, power. Um, we get strength to endure, wisdom, guidance, enlightenment, and hopefulness for any situation. Look at that list, my friends. That's a lot of goodies. That is a lot of good stuff that comes to you because of the work of the Holy Spirit. One way that I've kind of um, sometimes described the Holy Spirit to myself and occasionally to others if I think they'll understand, I think you're good, I think you'll understand, mobile God. Mobile God. <laughs> In other words, wherever you go, God's going with you. That's what the Holy Spirit means. Wherever you go, the, the actual full presence of God is going with you. And vice versa, wherever the presence of God is going out into the world and in your life, then, then you go along too. Both things are happening. The, um, the official theological words, so that you're smart and knowledgeable, theologically about um, the work of the Holy Spirit are, are these. The first is sanctification. So I know that you're awake. Say this out loud. Sanctification. Kind of a fun word. And literally that word means um, to grow holy. To, to be made holy. And that's what the work of the Holy Spirit is in you. The ongoing work of the Holy Spirit is that you are uh, being made holy. Holy, you are being purified, you are being cleansed, uh, so that on the day that you cross over to oh, the, cross the veil into God's heavenly kingdom, you are presented as one who is is uh, as clean as Jesus. How about that? God is God is continuing that work in your life sanctification. The other word is discipleship. So the work of the Holy Spirit is to draw you into those who are the followers of Jesus. And because you are in that group, then you are learning and you are growing as you go through life. Every step of the way, you are becoming more and more a follower of Jesus in every aspect of life, not just on Sundays, not just on Wednesday nights, not just when you do a little devotion in the morning, but all the time. More and more of your life becomes a following of God, and that's the work of the Holy Spirit in you. And that work it doesn't end. It is, in fact, it is only beginning in you. Uh, when you become a Christian, whether it's as a child, whether you're baptized or whatever you are, um, go through confirmation or whenever you made your public profession, whenever you just felt like, I'm a Christian now, that's just the start. Because of the Holy Spirit, now the good stuff starts to happen. Building on your salvation, now you get sanctified. And you experience the joy of following Jesus. And, and Paul is basically saying here, folks, if it weren't for the Holy Spirit, you would not get to experience each and every day how awesome it is to know Jesus and to have Jesus in your life. There is literally no better way to live your life than as a disciple of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is the one who makes that happen. So whenever I'm teaching new member classes, trying to describe specifically the work of the Holy Spirit, there are four things that I like to say, and I'm going to share them with you now. How, how does the Holy Spirit 
work in your life specifically? Well, the first thing that the Holy Spirit does is uh, he comes, uh, he is the one that brings you to faith. We had a baptism last week. It was awesome. Thank you for that. And I'm glad he came back. I mean, because, you know, sometimes after baptism, that's the last time you ever see him. <laughs> there was a, that reminds me of a quick joke. Uh, there was, uh, in, in a First Presbyterian Church in Lakeland, where I was for a little while, there was a bunch of bats that came and actually inhabited the, um, the, the ceiling, the, the attic, specifically in our chapel building. And, uh, you know, the guano was incredible and just really pungent. And so um, there was all sorts of things. They're kind of expensive uh, about how you can, ex you know, get the, the bats out, how you can, you know, chemically treat. And then we came up with this brilliant idea. We would baptize all of them, and then, that, then we know for sure they'd never return. <laughs> so I'm glad that didn't happen. <laughs> My man Palmer is back. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, uh, what, what, uh, what happens is uh, John Townsend and uh, um, uh, oh, let me, Henry Cloud are Christian psychologists, and there's this amazing book that they wrote called How People Grow. I have recommended this book so many times, I've lost count. How People Grow by Cloud and Townsend. And the way they put it is this way. The Spirit begins the process of growth by wooing us to Jesus. And that, and that and, and so Jesus is kind of a matchmaker. If you are a Christian, give thanks to God and specifically the Holy Spirit because it's the Holy Spirit that made it happen. Working through parents, working through a church, working through a pastor, working through friends, it's the Holy Spirit that made it happen. Secondly, the work of the Holy Spirit is it's the Holy Spirit who is the means by which God speaks to us. So when you pray, it is the Holy Spirit that is prompting you. And it's the Holy Spirit who is, is helping you form your words. And it's the Holy Spirit that's making the connection between yourself and God as you pray. When you open up the scriptures, when you open up the Bible, either here in church or at home, whenever you open up the Bible, it's the Holy Spirit that's directing you to the place where you need to go, the guidance you need to receive, understanding that. It's the Holy Spirit that's working in your mind to help you understand what the scriptures are trying to tell you. And then it's the Holy Spirit that's, that's challenging you to apply what God's word is telling you in your daily life. Um, when, when you receive what's, what some people call the inner testimony of the Spirit, you feel God speaking into your conscience or into your heart or into your soul, guiding you and directing you. That's the Holy Spirit that is that voice inside of you that's, that's beckoning you, it's urging you. That's the Spirit that's, uh, that's something we can all relate to, this inner voice of the conscience. Whenever somebody is, is, is intervening in your life to speak God's word, that's the Holy Spirit prompting that. You know, you come to church and, and you hear a preacher, and we get this tendency to think, man, the preacher is great. I know you think that all the time. This preacher is so talented. <laughs> but really what's happening, it's the star of the show isn't a preacher, the star of the show is the Holy Spirit speaking through the preacher, speaking through the choir, speaking through the person who's reading Scripture. We're all becoming a part of the Holy Spirit speaking into the church. We don't need any more all-star preachers. We need people that are lifting up the work of the Holy Spirit speaking into the church. Am I right about that? That's what we need. And... Um, the coolest thing about all this is the Holy Spirit also, on top of all this communication, gives you the ability to discern. The Holy Spirit gives you filters as you grow by which you can, you can see, you can, you can ascertain, is this God speaking to me or is it something else? You know, is this the world speaking to me? Or what often is the case, am I trying to speak to myself and say, oh no, it's God speaking. When really it's just me trying to, to convince myself and others that's what I want to do. No, the Spirit gives you that discerning power. 
to know what to do. When you experience hardship in life, this is the third thing. The Holy Spirit is at your side as you face any challenge, any hardship, any suffering. You are never alone. Check out this verse. Also from Romans chapter 8 where Paul says, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our what? What's that word up there? Weakness. When we feel the weakest, we do not know what we ought to pray for. We're stumbling over our words. We're just confused and overwhelmed. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. The word that Jesus used for the Holy Spirit in John's Gospel, 14 and, chapter 14 and 16, is the Greek word parakletos. Often it's translated into the English counselor. But literally what it means is one who comes and walks beside. You always have the powerful, complete presence of God with you if you're walking through beside still waters and green pastures or if you're walking into the valley of the shadow of death. God is with you. And then finally... The Holy Spirit is God's pledge that you will get to your finish line safely and whole so that you can make that final transition. Also in chapter 8, check out these words from Paul. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, then he who raised Christ, God, from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who is in you. The spirit is guiding you, conducting you. The mission of the spirit is to bring you safe to the finish line of your life whenever that is. And the way the spirit does that is by being with you every step of the way, calling you higher calling you deeper in. Anybody read C.S. Lewis? The Chronicles of Narnia, incredible series of books, though the last book has this great line. I don't remember who says it, but um, this great line in the very last book, I have come home at last. This is my real country. I belong here. This is the land I've been looking for all my life, though I never knew it till now. Come further up, come further in. Come further up, come further in. The work of the Spirit is that every single day, He is calling us closer and closer to heaven, into a deeper experience of our eternal life, not waiting till then, but now, by beckoning us, come further up, come further in. Come further up, come further in to Jesus' amazing kingdom. All right, so you want to, you say you want to experience the Holy Spirit this week. Well, I got two exercises for you to do this week. The first is carve out some quietness. I'm going to tell you that the biggest obstacle for most of us in terms of experiencing the Holy Spirit is there's too much dang noise. In our life, there's too much busyness. We have packed things into our life. And I'm going to tell you, I I think that often it's because we, we resist the presence of the Holy Spirit. But stop doing that. You get you're missing out on too many goodies. If you're resisting the presence of the Spirit, welcome the Spirit. But you if you're gonna be doing that, you need to be in a posturing of listening. Uh, And you can only do that, I think, just by five minutes every day, some quietness. Believe me, I'm I'm in here too. I have a trouble getting five minutes of quietness where I'm not filling my mind with the stuff of the world. Instead, just turn off your phone, turn off your tablet. People, you'll still be there five minutes later. People can connect with you. It's just five minutes. Remove the distractions. Go to a quiet place. If there's any noise at all, maybe some soft music that helps you, some meditative music, but just just be still before the Lord so that you can hear his voice. The second thing is look for dust. Look for dust. What do I mean by that? Well, 
Somebody once described to me that the way that you discern the way the Holy Spirit is working is by looking for the dust that is kicked up by the Holy Spirit's wind. The word for spirit in both the Old Testament Hebrew and the New Testament Greek, both of those words also mean breath or wind. And what I've found is that if I'm attentive to what's going on around me in my life, the Holy Spirit is going to direct me and guide me by showing me these ways that he's kicking up dust around me. Even when I'm watching the news or I'm reading the the news on my uh, on my phone or whatever, sometimes I can feel that, oh wait, the Holy Spirit's doing something in the world. The Holy Spirit's wanting me to love those who are refugees. The Holy Spirit's wanting me to help those who find themselves homeless. Oh, 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 I see it. You can find it in your relationships, in your marriages, and in your friendships, and in your parenting. The Holy Spirit will be faithful and kick up some dust where you go, oh wait, this is what the Holy Spirit wants me to see. How to be more loving and how to be more connected and to be a more faithful witness for Jesus in the lives of the people I love. I'm promising you the Holy Spirit will make himself known. But we just need to see and sometimes that means looking for the dust. Looking for the dust. All right, let me pray. Holy Spirit, It is a joy to pray directly to you and acknowledge your existence and your presence each and every day of our lives. You are a pledge. You are a promise of God that that we will never be alone. That the work that was started by Jesus will be carried all the way to its fullest completion in our lives. You are a pledge and a promise that at the end of our lives, we will be carried safely beyond into our eternal life, leaving behind richness and blessing and bounty, which will be experienced for generations. Lord, we just confess to you that there are many ways that we resist and block the work of the Holy Spirit, chief of which sometimes is just ignorance, not knowing how the Holy Spirit is working and speaking and guiding and directing. Lord, may that end now, may that end today, so that the mission of the Spirit can be fully felt and we bask in your goodness and your blessing each and every day. In Jesus' name, amen.